you're saved in Jesus Christ. Say amen. 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 That means that half of you are doing okay. Praise the Lord. I remember when I, coming up to summer, go to Luke 13. Coming up in July, the anniversary time of my physical birth, of course, in July, but spiritual birth. And I remember when I could actually sing something like that and it meant something. You are holy, holy. My quest and my years that are before me that has been the same since I came to know Christ as Savior is to have that kind of time with him. And uh, um, when I sing alone, it doesn't sound like that, but that's okay, you know. But to sing the Psalms, read the Psalms, and to praise him with great gratitude over my salvation, I pray that your salvation means that much to you, that you know what it means to be saved. We're going to talk about what it means to be saved this morning at the end of chapter number three of Luke's gospel. Uh, Jesus Christ is once again direct, and, and for some difficult, for some just right on, the, right on that rough, raw, direct place, and, uh, and that's, that's Jesus Christ, and, and so that's some, some beautiful praise and worship. Uh, Dwayne and Teresa, away, pray for them. They'll be about back home uh, this week, and they get away for a little bit, uh, but it's wonderful to have different singers and a tremendous team of people that love to praise the Lord and different songs that we choose. And the words, I pray they don't escape uh, your mind and your heart as you're singing them. And say, well, I I like a certain kind of song, a certain kind of way. Well, if you grab the lyrics and hear the words, you're going, that ought to be the way that we enter into his courts with thanksgiving and realize that uh, he is holy holy, holy, holy. You will sing that a little bit one day in glory when you're absent from the body. You'll be present with the Lord and you'll be singing stuff like that. At least that's what I hear. It's in the Bible. When we're going to work on a chapter, of course, in Luke, we get, of course, to the beginning of one. We, and, of course, we started the second half a few weeks ago of our study. Here we are at the end of another chapter, chapter number 13. And and again, as I mentioned earlier, Jesus' language is very direct, and, and uh, it's because he's on a mission. In this particular setting, at the end of 13, he's on his way over to Perea. He has been in Judea, Galilee. Uh, they're kind of antagonistic against them. They, they've kind of maybe had enough of Jesus, but he's on his way to Jerusalem, and he's on a mission, as I said earlier. He's, he's headed to the cross. He's headed to fulfill the Father's will for his life. Because, of course, as we get to these last few days and weeks and basically three and a half months of Jesus' earthly ministry, we'll see in uh, Luke 19 that Jesus has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Of course, our theme verse of the study that we have in the Gospel of Luke. And, and uh, hey, you and I, we have to focus in kind of hone in on and, and realize why we're here. We're here to really praise him, <clears throat> honor him, give him glory. We're going to partake in the Lord's Supper here in a little bit. Some of you have already had a Bible lesson. You're already all set. You've had a, a meeting, uh, a time over the Word of God with uh, a Sunday group or class. You, maybe some of the kids, of course, all the kids have had, if they were in the faith place with the little ones and the Older ones, they've already learned some Bible. The youth group is now studying the Bible. Here we are, right here in this setting, in these four walls, saying, okay, God, I'm here for you. As I say often, we open the Bible and say, God, give me something. And that's a a good way to approach. That's scriptural. God, feed me and teach me. And uh, that ought to be the way that we walk out of saying, God, you gave me something this morning. You taught me something. And And I sure hope that you understand that when Jesus says, I'm the Son of Man, and I've come to seek and to save that which is lost, he was speaking to a bunch of people that were as lost as the people that that are around you right now that are not saved. 
Think of the thousands and millions and billions of people that have gone before you and they are not saved. They took their last breath. They went off into eternity. And in their condemnation, they came from their own sin. They were not saved. One of the things that Jesus Christ declared in John chapter number 3, it was one of the three verses that the camp uh, theme was built upon, believe it, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Excuse me. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Well, that's what we're going to talk about today. In your, before we even read it, uh, the whole passage, look at verse number 23 in chapter 13. And it says, Lord, are there few that be saved? That is a powerful statement right there. You say, well, that's a question. Yes, it is. But it's a powerful statement. That means that the premise from the crowd, and we don't know who asked it, but somebody asked it in that crowd of people in Perea as Jesus has now made his way there. If you looked at John's gospel in chapter 9 and 10, they would kind of fit right into the text of verses 21, 22, 23, where Jesus again is headed into Jerusalem, but on his way, he stops off at different places. Consider this landmark statement in verse number 22, that it says that he went through cities and villages teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem, He's definitely making it clear out in front of everybody, hey, I'm on that mission. I'm headed to Jerusalem. Go to Luke chapter number 9 real quick. Luke 9, verse number 51. Another linchpin statement by Jesus Christ. And it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up. Luke 9, 51, he says, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. From that point, Luke 9, another reminder in Luke 13, and all the way through chapter number 19, before that Passion Week, Jesus Christ has let people know what I am doing, where I'm heading, and I am purpose-filled and I am focused. Jesus Christ is dealing with the audience, he's interacting, he's preaching, He's teaching, he's giving them harsh warnings to the crowd, the scribes, the Pharisees, the disciples, the hypocrites. And so as we look at the text today, Luke 13, I simply entitled it Direct Jesus. We have spoken about this method by which Jesus talks to people. And in this case, we're going to look at his directness over salvation. Last week we looked at fruit. My Christianity, is it a fruit-filled life or am I living a failed-filled life? You say, oh, you're just being so harsh and judgmental and mean and critical. I'm looking at Scripture and Jesus Christ is talking about fruit. He's talking about to the Pharisees, the scribes. He's speaking to the crowd at hand there and uh, the few verses just before the end. And he's saying uh, in Luke 13, hey, you know what? You guys need to say, I mean, put up, uh, you say certain things, but your actions don't match. You, you, you say that you, uh, you're really a follower of me. You say that you really believe in me, and yet you're like that group in John 6 that, decided as disciples to no longer follow Jesus Christ. That's where we were last week. And here we are now in our study, and as we looked at that, those two little parables of Jesus Christ uh, and using the leaven and using the mustard seed and how we saw that Jesus Christ healed in the synagogue a woman that was bowed over. She was bowed over for 18 years, and they criticized him for that. We now see Jesus Christ answering back to someone about how many people are saved. Again, I want you to think before I read this passage of Scripture. 
how many people do you know that have never gotten saved? A mission trip is good, of course. Going to a foreign field. A big camp is good to see all kinds of kids around and think, wow, I wonder if all those kids are saved, they're born again. You see, it is a Bible term. And yet, we may not even use it very much when we talk to people. Are you saved? Do you remember a time when you received Christ as Savior and you got saved? And that's what Jesus Christ does today in our study. I want you again to consider your salvation as we are going to come to the Lord's Supper and be reminded of how direct Jesus Christ can be when it comes to the doctrine of a fruit-filled and fruit-bearing life, the doctrine and truth of a saved life. Are you saved today? Would you say, yes, I know Jesus is Savior? What if he was to ask you or you were to ask him to say, hey, Jesus, do you know me? Am I a son of God? As many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Are you saved today? And beyond that, since you are saved, again, when's the last time you and I asked someone, are you saved? Let's read the text today and see how the Word of God generates this particular lesson, this argument, this message about the truth of what it means to be saved. Let's pick it up. Verse number 22. I read a little bit earlier, but let's read 22 down through 35. Speaking of Jesus, he went through the cities and villages, teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. Then said one <clears throat> unto him, Lord, are there few that be saved? And he said unto them, Strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. When once the master of the house is risen up and hath shut the door, and ye begin to stand without and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. And he shall answer and say unto you, I know you not when she are. Verse 26. Then shall you begin to say, We have hung out with you, Jesus. We have eaten and drunk in thy presence, and thou hast taught in our streets. But he shall say, I tell you, I know you not whence ye are. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when ye shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and you yourselves thrust out. And they shall come from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south and shall sit down in the kingdom of God. There will be people other than Jews, other than Israel, that will come from all over this world because, very simply, they wanted to be saved. They wanted to be in the kingdom of God. It says in verse 30, And behold, there are last which shall be first, and there are first which shall be last. Verse 31, down to the end of the chapter. All of a sudden now the Pharisees are concerned about Jesus' well-being. In the same day there came certain of the Pharisees, saying unto him, Get thee out, and depart hence, for Herod will kill thee. Remember, up to this point, Herod, all he's done is wanted to beat Jesus. He's intrigued by Jesus. We don't have any indication of this other than he wants to meet him. Think of what the Pharisees are doing. I'm not going to read too much into it, but think of the setting here in this whole setup as Jesus is in Perea on the other side of the Jordan River where, by the way, John the Baptist has had a lot of ministry and Herod is the governing official over this area. How does Jesus respond? <laughs> he said unto them, Go ye and tell that fox, <laughs> Behold, I cast out devils, 
and I do cures today and tomorrow and the third day I shall be perfected. Nevertheless, I must walk today and tomorrow and the day following. For it cannot be that a prophet perish out of Jerusalem. Now here we have again Jesus' heavy heart over the people. Verse 34, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which killest the prophets and stonest them that are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together as a hen doth gather her brood under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate, and verily I say unto you, ye shall not see me until the time come when ye shall say, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Now let me pray just for a moment and then we'll just dig in here. Now Father in heaven, we put this whole time that we gather in the name of Jesus together before you. It's for your glory, for your honor. You do that which you desire to do. We come as living sacrifices. We come before you and we present ourselves ready for you to do a work in us. We desire for your will to be done in our lives. This text talks about so few being saved. I pray that as we look at how direct you are, Jesus Christ, that will gather and grasp the brevity and seriousness of all those that are not saved. The term to be saved is important and that we will walk out after our time together going, Lord, I'm so thankful that you saved my soul, that you made me whole. God, have your way in our time of meeting over your word right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I mentioned it earlier and just setting up the text, but as Jesus moved toward Jerusalem, he went to Perea as people in Judea had become and had, be, had become, had became. I don't think that's proper English. Could you please fix that, strike that from the record? Had become more antagonistic. It says in John chapter number 10, I mentioned that there's a, a setting of John 9 and 10 that tie together with this setting historically and chronologically. It says in verse number 40, it's up on the screen and Jesus went away again beyond Jordan to the place where John at first baptized, and there he abode, and many resorted unto him and said, John did no miracle, but all the things that John spoke of this man were true, and many believed on him there. That is the setting and the setup. This is where we are historically setting that groundwork. Now, doctrinally, the end of Luke 13 delivered one of those unabashed, questions from an individual in a crowd we don't know it doesn't say who it is but in this crowd this person is asking a question about the number one subject salvation how to be saved lord are there few that be saved that is a strong strong question it really even puts before you the realization that in the crowd of people listening that they understand that not many people get saved. Not many people are in after the door is closed. Not many people are at the feast and the meal and those Jews are going, hey, Abraham's there and Isaac and Jacob. We want to be there. Jesus deals with that because we are talking to the Jews. But we're also talking to the rest of the crowd. There's a lot of Gentiles around from the north to the south, the east to the west. This is the final three and a half months of his ministry his uh, earthly ministry, Jesus Christ, is really filled with, again, this heavy heart for people, even though he was around a bunch of people that wanted him dead. I just couldn't get their way yet. The many types of people whom confronted Jesus Christ in the final few months gained, I see it as brashness. The more you study it, the more you read it. They grabbed a boldness toward the Savior of the world. Was it curiosity? Maybe it was. Maybe it was contention. Or maybe it was even contempt. Familiarity does breed contempt. I find that sometimes in being around people, uh, believers in the Lord, maybe sometimes we get a little bit extra comfortable with one another and we, 
we kind of push what we talk about, or maybe we become a little disrespectful. The people here in the crowd, that again, through Judea, they had become brash, mean-spirited. I mentioned, I think, last week or the week before, in the text of chapter number 12 and 13, it's almost as though we couldn't differentiate between this innumerable multitudes of people and the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees and the religious people of the temple that were mean-spirited. Almost like everyone around Jesus, with the exception of a small percentage, were being mean-spirited. Again, brash, bold. And then we have this question. Hey, are there that few people that are really going to get saved? Just by the premise of the question, just by the thinking that had to be behind that question. If you like history a little bit, biblical history, that's one thing, just reading through Scripture and thinking about the people groups that are in the Bible. But history in general, how many millions and millions, I said it earlier, think of the wars, think of the nation of Israel going into the promised land and the book of Joshua, hundreds of years after that, I mean, after the book of Joshua, the hundreds of years in the book of Judges and the battles that had been already waged in the short time of Joshua taking that leadership along with Caleb and the nation of Israel was to be set up and all, all that was supposed to be so good but yet there was constant contention and wars and battles and fights. How many of those people groups, how many people really knew the Lord since Jesus Christ was crucified, buried and rose again on the third day and he was perfected? How many people are still lost, never got saved? 2,000 years. In the kingdom of God and his righteousness and people knowing, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You need to be saved from your sin, from your iniquity. Jesus said it himself. Today I just want you to think about that title again I put up there, that Jesus is direct in so many ways and he's direct about salvation. How direct are you about your salvation? And would Jesus Christ say, hey, I know you. I know who you are. Go to Matthew 7 for just a minute. Matthew 7, you know, it's the Sermon on the Mount. We studied the Sermon on the Plain and, and Luke's Gospel. The Sermon on the Mount is in the beginning of Jesus' ministry, correct? Very early on. First preaching message, as far as we can tell, the Sermon on the Mount. He's got his disciples gathered around him while there's a big multitude of people that is, of course, with him. There's multitudes. He went up on a mountain. His disciples came up unto him. So he's got quite a crowd. And in verse number 21 of chapter number 7 in the Sermon on the Mount, it says, Not everyone. Here's Jesus Christ speaking. The red letters. It saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, and he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. It's kind of like the way Jesus is speaking in Luke chapter number 14, I'm, excuse me, 13, about, hey, there'll be people that'll say they've eaten and drunk in my presence and taught in the streets. And he says, as we go to Matthew 7, that simple statement in verse 23, and then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. That's the lost, those that are not saved. Luke chapter number 13. So the question is, does Jesus know you? Does Jesus know me? So I call on the, I know Jesus as Savior, amen. What if we were willing to say, Jesus, do you know me? What would he say? Would he say, yes, I remember when you gave your life and you trusted in my life that I gave for you. You are one of the sons of God. So that's how each one of these simple lesson points come at you, is in this direct Jesus, does Jesus know you? Well, let me put up the first one. You'll grab where I'm at going. Does Jesus know you? 
a question of salvation. Ex expect the Son of Man to answer purposefully with no apologetic words. Agreed? Jesus Christ is going to answer unapolog unapologetically. He's not going to use any apologetic type of words when he answers what it means what, about this simple question. Lord, are there few that be saved? I wonder how many people in percentages want a deep doctrinal knowledge of what the Bible teaches, and yet they have such a shallow witness for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're so about arguing and fighting and wrestling and having apologetics over so many matters. And those doctrines are so very important, yes. But we're desirous of deep doctrinal knowledge, and yet we're shallow in gospel witness, and there's people that are not saved. If Jesus Christ is answering a direct, direct question from somebody in the crowd asking about, are there so few? that be saved? Would that apply today? I know it's 2,000 years ago in the setting, but are there that few that be saved? There's very few. Very, very few. Go to Romans chapter number 5, a familiar passage you've used once or twice. And since the Bible is filled with great answers and great text, and you find a couple of good ones, sometimes you just kind of kind of use them again and again. Romans chapter number 5, I put up a few verses up there, verses number 7 through 10. Of course, this text, if you take Romans 5, 6, and 7, and that's all you had from a Bible, I think you would do pretty well to grab a lot of doctrine, justification, propitiation, the forgiveness, everything that you need to know about faith, dead in Christ. It says in verse number seven, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commended his love toward us in that while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. Here we go now, here we go. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be we shall be saved from wrath through him. To be saved from wrath. Verse 10. I think we got something more here. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be by his life. <laughs> we're saved from the wrath. And we're saved by his life. It's an important, so very important, scriptural, doctrinal truth. Talking to somebody about this subject is such a good thing. It might not be your first or second time of talking to people about Bible things, but you got to get here quickly because of the simplicity of the question that someone asks with innocency and yet so much meaning. Lord, are there few that be saved? Jesus said a little bit more than, yep. Does Jesus know you? He will purposefully, with no apologetic words, speak about salvation Secondly, does Jesus know you? The question of salvation. Back to Luke chapter number 13. Expect the Son of Man to answer profoundly with piercing personal words. This is personal. Remember back in chapter number 12, I mean chapter number 13 earlier, when people came and told them about the Galileans, the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered and said, hey, <coughs> those Galileans are sinners of all the Galileans. 
because I suffer such things. I tell you nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. He brought the doctrine of repentance right on to an individual person. He brought the fruit issue to an individual person. And now he brings the salvation issue with piercing personal words directly to people one-on-one. It's personal. Do we understand Jesus and how direct he is? He's after our minds. He's after our hearts. He's after our will. Go to John chapter number 10 if you wouldn't mind. Real quick as a simple reference here. You see, you need to expect, and I need to expect, that the Son of Man, when you open up the Bible and say, this is what the Son of Man, the Son of God, Jesus Christ said, he's going to be pointed, direct, he's going to be rough, he's going to be raw, he's going to put it right there. And in this doctrine of salvation, he's right there with this one. John chapter number 10. You know the first few verses are about Jesus being the true shepherd, right? The first five or six verses, he used that parable. He's talking to the religious people and helping them understand who he really is in this picture of you as sheep need a shepherd. But he starts in verse number seven with talking about being the good shepherd. I am the door, here it is. Verse number seven, chapter number 10. Then said Jesus unto them, again, verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be? Ooh, there's a lot of this stuff in the Bible. You must have looked some things up. I spent two minutes on it. Just kidding. There's a lot of stuff in the Bible about to be saved. This is just bringing to light, brothers and sisters in the Lord. Hey, if you're not saved today, if you're lost, there's a lot to be said about to be saved save from the wrath of the condemnation for your iniquities and by his life that he saved your soul. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that's a hireling and not the sheep, shepherd whose own sheep are not, seeing the wolf coming and leave the sheep and fleeth, and the wolf catch them and scattereth the sheep. I'm telling you, there's so many hirelings around that they just have this look about or, or, or act about or they talk or they have this way about, hey, I'm your shepherd, I'll take care of you sheep, and yet, uh-uh, they're a hireling, and they will not lead you to salvation in Jesus Christ. They'll leave you away, lead you away from the good shepherd, they'll lead you away from the door that you and I are to enter into, that we entered into when we got saved. For me, it's almost 41 years. Third one, does Jesus know you? A question of salvation once again. And this question of salvation, again, back to verse number 23, Lord, are there few that be saved? And he said unto them, expect the Son of Man to answer prophetically with Israel's mandated words. Now he's going to go really strong to Israel. You see, if you open up your Bible a little bit in view of Israel and understand God's viewpoint, of course, you're going to have all the narratives of all the things. When you hear Jesus' words toward Israel, they are pretty tough. They are pretty rough. They are direct and they are truth. You have denied and rejected and murdered the prophets that spoke of me. And then, to top it all off, I'm the Messiah who's headed to Jerusalem where in three days I'll be perfected. And hey, Herod, you want to get in the way of me? You're not getting in the way of me. But even before that, in his illustration, in his teaching, in his prophetical type of teaching to Israel, he's saying, you've been mandated to, pro- to pay attention to the Messiah, to look for the one that's been prophesied of. Turn to Isaiah chapter number 61 with me. It says in Luke's gospel, verses 28, 29, and 30, let me reiterate There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, which points to the judgment and condemnation that 
that eternal fire that quenches not. The whole idea of that just blows me away, and it's agonizing to think. And Jesus says, when you shall see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all the prophets in the kingdom of God, and you yourselves are thrust out, how could they continually reject? How could they be too late when the door is shut? How could Israel just continually say, no, no, no? And as that's happening, verse 29 tells me that those Gentiles that are from the east, south, north, west, they shall sit down in the kingdom because the gospel's going to go to all people. And as Jesus said, behold, there are last which shall be first, and there are first which shall be last. Isaiah 61 up on the screen. The Spirit of the Lord is, come, is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted to proclaim liberty to the captives, the opening prison of the prisons of them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn. He continues in verse number three, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Jesus was prophesied and and filled. And he will fulfill all, and he has. He was the preacher, he was the healer, he was the deliverer, he was the comforter, he is the planter. He's everything that's in that text. And he can expository preach it better than anybody since he's the centerpiece of the exposition of it all. Don't forget he (laughs) read that in the synagogue at Nazareth (laughs) as the lesson of the day. This is Jesus. This is Jesus saying, hey, I'm going to speak to you with an answer that's prophetical, Israel, and I'm going to give you your mandate. This is what you're supposed to do with me, and you continually reject me. Does Jesus know? Does Jesus know? Fourth and fifth. Fourthly, back to Luke chapter number 13. Does Jesus know you? The question of salvation. You can expect the Son of Man to answer proverbially. He's going to speak and answer proverbially. Like with a little proverb. But he may have a little bit of sarcasm. Has anybody ever noticed that the Bible has a neat batch of sarcasm in it? I kind of like that. It gives me a good chuckle now and then. Jesus is going to give you a chuckle right here. I'm sure you already stopped and went, hmm, what kind of animal is a fox? Ah, they're sly. (laughs) They're scavengers. They're cunning. They usually try to go and find food at dark. It's interesting that Jesus Christ calls Herod a fox. I was joking. Well, actually, it wasn't. It turned out to be a chuckle, but it was kind of good when Derek Thomas said, you know, it's kind of funny how Jesus is there with, of course, already some sarcasm, and he says, he says to me, Brownie, I was thinking of something. I, I need to tell you after service. He says, Jesus Christ tells him, hey, I cast out devils. I cure people. You're just a little tiny fox. Who do you think you are? You're a fox? Oh, King Herod, he's the man. And he said unto them in verse 32, Go ye and tell that fox. (laughs) I cast out devils. I do cures today and tomorrow, and guess what? I'll be resurrected on the third day. And you're a fox. (laughs) I added that. That's not in my that's in my Bible in the column over here. I got a wide margin. Verse 33 says, Nevertheless, I must walk today, tomorrow, and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet perisheth out of Jerusalem. 
because they've killed every prophet that went to Jerusalem to tell them. Whew. Things are going to happen there. My death, burial, and resurrection is going to happen there. Oh, my. Jesus Christ, he does use a little bit of proverbial sarcasm. John chapter number 7, if you want to join me there, real quick look. This is the quick look passage. It's up on the screen. I just grabbed uh, 28 through uh, 30. Of course, he's in Jerusalem again. In this particular setting, and we, again, see Jesus Christ dealing with divisions, meanness, pharisaical teaching. We'll just grab 28. Then cried Jesus in the temple as he taught, saying, You both know me, and know, you know whence I am, and I am not come of myself, but he that sent me is true, whom you know not. But I know him, for I am from him, and he has sent me. Verse 30. Then they sought to take him, but no man laid hands on him, because his hour was not yet come. That was spoken of more than once. Remember Jesus in the miracle of Cana. It's not my time. It's not time yet. And you are not going to stop my heavenly Father from fulfilling his will in me, no matter what you think you have the power to do. Verse 31 says, And many of the people believed on him and said, When Christ cometh, will he do more miracles than these which this man hath done? <laughs> Do you pick up on this stuff? Remember verse 32 and on. The Pharisees heard the people murmured and such things concerning him, and the Pharisees and chief priests sent officers to take him. What do they want to do? They want to rush up the timeline, but you're not going to get in the way of Jesus Christ. He used a little proverbial statement to speak about Herod, And as the Pharisees are told to bring that statement, he's using them as well to minimize their importance, though they think they're the most important in the room. Our last little point of reference in our lesson today on direct Jesus. Does Jesus know you? The question of salvation Expect the Son of Man to answer passionately with lamenting words. Now we capture this part of Jesus in his own words. Verse 34. O Jerusalem, O Jerusalem, which killest the prophets, and stonest them that are sent unto thee, How often would I have gathered thy children together? I would have taken care of you. As a hen doth gather her brood under her wings, and ye would not. Go to Psalm 118 with me real quick, and then I'll finish up over in Isaiah again. Go to Psalm 118. Behold, your house is left desolate to you, left desolate. Unto you desolate, and I verily, and verily I say unto you, you shall not see me until the time come when ye shall say, Blessed is he that come in the name of the Lord. Woo, Israel, you people that have to listen. Jerusalem, there's quite a crowd that's gathered here in Perea as he's speaking to them, and he's covering the vast expanse of people groups and the cultural background of lost, of saved, of believe, of half-believe, of hypocrisy, of a Pharisee, of a scribe. He's got them all in the audience. It says in Psalm 118, verse 25, Save now, I beseech thee, O Lord, O Lord. I beseech thee, and send now prosperity. Where does this passage, where does this verse come? Verse 26 of Psalm 118. Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. It continues, we have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. God is the Lord, which has showed us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords, even unto the horns of the altar. Thou art my God, and I will praise thee. Thou art my God, I will exalt thee. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Woo, that's a powerful statement of holy God about himself and about his son. His mercy endures forever. 
Isaiah chapter number 9. It's up on the screen. You can't miss with this one, verses 6 and 7. For unto us a child is born, unto a son is given. And I know we only read this at Christmas time. My goodness, would we not just read this in the prophetical context of Jesus Christ speaking to Jerusalem? And he laments and he's brokenhearted over them. I am come for you. I'm going to be your king. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful Counsel of the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace of the increase of his government and peace. There shall be no end upon the throne of David. He's king. Upon his kingdom to order it, to establish it with judgment, with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Jesus Christ, he is all. He's the one by which we are to be saved. You know it says in Acts chapter number four, neither is there salvation in any other name. There is another name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be. Acts chapter number two, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall. Acts chapter number 15, but we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ we shall be even as they. Acts chapter number 16, this guy, this prison keeper, one of the coolest stories in all the Acts of the Apostles. Oh, Paul and Silas, they sing, they get broken out of jail. The prison keeper says, what do we do? And brought them out and says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be in thy house. You know, that's in the Acts. You know, Jesus said it himself. I just put three verses up here. You go and study it out. Jesus said it. Jesus said it. John, chapter number 3. I said it earlier, for God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be. John 5, 34. But I receive not testimony from man, but these things I say, that ye might be. I wanted to do the be saved, so there you go. So I messed you up. That ye might be? Yes, we're doing better now. You need a good lead in. And remember what John 10, 9, I left it there on purpose for this right now. I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be? Saved. And shall go in and out and find pasture. Saved. Saved. think of how many people you know that aren't saved. I mean it. They start going through your filing cabinet. I know you're glad you're saved. You gotta be. So as we come to the Lord's Supper, let's rejoice in being saved. What words would Jesus Christ speak to us personally if we were to ask him? Jesus, do you know me? Jesus? I mean, Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? What kind of answer would Jesus, well, I know, you, I know you're saved. But maybe not, I don't know. That's between you and him. But how many other people that you know can sing songs like this, rejoice in this, pray like this, and take the Lord's Supper and say, I'm not saved. I need to be saved. We enter into the Lord's Supper forever grateful. I say this all the time. For our salvation in Jesus Christ. Would you please stand with me and bow your heads for a word of prayer? Bow your heads. Let's pray to the Lord over the Lord's Supper as I have Bobby, come, and Randy, can you help me out a little bit? Why don't you bow your heads? Let me pray over you. Cindy, I mean, excuse me. Debbie, would you please pray? Play in the background. Father in heaven, I come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your word before us. What a question. Lord? There'll be so few that are saved. Oh my. Jesus, uh, 
thank you for your directness. I needed this today. We all need it. Thank you for saving our souls and teaching us what it means to be saved. Now we come to your communion and Lord's Supper time, the memorial of the Passover, I pray. Be honored and glorified. Grab a hold of our hearts as we remember what you did for us, Jesus. We praise these things in your name. Amen.